All right, Johan, what's up, man? Johan's one of my students. This guy is impressive. He is, are you 17, bro? 17, yeah. This guy is 17. He's out here marketing and hustling and just has an awesome amount of energy and is going to be the next rock star real estate investor. I'm confident of it. So I'm jumping on today with Johan for you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes. And we're going to just going to talk a little bit about real estate investing. And uh, we're going to just do a little one-on-one -on -one coaching with Johan and uh, see what we can do to help him be a better investor and to do more deals. So Johan, what's up, man? How are things? What are you working on? And what are you struggling with as well? I want to learn a little bit more about, you know, what you've been up to and what you're working on so we can figure out the best way to help you do more deals. Yeah, so right now um, I'm struggling on getting good quality leads um, and following up with the leads, you know, how to follow up with them, what to say on the follow up calls and, and just trying to get them to close. I have all the data um, and I'm just marketing them through an SMS campaign with batch leads. Awesome. Love batch. Sending about 500, 700 texts a day, nice. five days. And but the, the market that I'm in is really saturated, so I'm going to try to move up a little more north the market that area okay so what market with, are you in you're down in florida right in florida yeah uh broward county around uh, like 30 minutes away from miami are you okay awesome that's that's great oh, yeah. i love it down there man nice weather beautiful yeah very cool okay so you are sending texts already with batch you're doing 500 to 700 a day that's a great amount Mm -hmm. Um, I love it. What are, what are you seeing from the responses? Are you getting good response rates from people with the call, with the texting? Maybe like every day I get one or two people saying yes, maybe that's three people. Great. That's amazing. One or two people but, that say yes. Yeah. But the okay. thing is most of them asking market price or more. Okay. Uh, understood. And that's, that's okay. That's going to happen. Yeah. So when these people are saying yes, that they have interested in selling and if they're above market price, maybe not worth your time, but if they're near market or just under, are you adding these leads to a system, a CRM, or at least tagging them in batch, you know, and creating a task to follow up with them in let's say a month or in two months or three months or something along those lines? Yeah, I'm, I'm adding, I'm pushing the, the leads to Podio and then I have a calendar in Podio. So then I just call, I have an appointments with them. Perfect. So, yeah. Okay, cool. Follow up is the name of the game, my friend. I want to make sure that you know yeah. that. And I'm pretty sure you do because you've been on some of the recent calls. Uh, follow up is so incredibly important. You know, Mike and I in our business, we, we see leads come in. And on average, it's going to take us two to three months on a good, on a short period of time. And on a long period of time, it could be as many as four to six months. So if you were to average out, you know, the last, let's say seven years of all of the data and all of the leads that we've added in, you know, it's probably somewhere around five or six months from the time the lead comes in to the time that we're going to actually be able to get these under contract. So that's seven years of data. That could mean that, you know, we had marketed to a lead six or seven years ago and we followed up with them every week or every month or every quarter for seven years. And then all of a sudden, finally, they get motivated and they're ready to go. So I would say the first thing I would highly recommend if you're not already, and it sounds like you are already, is to mm -hmm. add anybody that has any interest. Now, if they're above retail, probably not that motivated. It's probably not worth the time, but it doesn't mean that you can't follow up. But if they are you know, at retail or slightly under or even more so under, you definitely 100% want to follow up with these people. This is the follow-up business. Really, it's the marketing business but you need to be able to generate leads to follow up on, right? So it's a combination of both marketing and following up. Those two things are super important. Love it. So you're doing that. And, um, and then the people that you are following up with, what kind of frequency? Is, does it vary depending on how motivated they are or if they have a high level of motivation or what are you doing there? Yeah, so some people, um, I give them a call and they say, give me a call in a couple months. And then I'll talk to you then. So I put in the calendar a couple of months by, from now. And then I give them a call. Perfect. Then, now you've only been at this for what? How, how long have you been, have you been marketing? I started 
well for for the for sms i've been i started in december beginning of december beginning of december so we're in january 19th so you've only been at this for five or six weeks for the most part right yeah perfect okay cool so like i just said though the follow-up efforts sometimes can take you know three four five months six months in some cases right i mean they can take five six seven years even right but when you average it it's going to typically be a couple months all right so keep doing what you're doing you're doing great there all right I, I want to ask a couple questions here as well. Whenever you get somebody that's interested, are you continuing to text them or are you actually picking up the phone and calling them or maybe texting back saying, Hey, when's a good time to get them on the phone? I, Cause I, and I'm pretty sure you're aware of this, but the goal is to get people on the phone. Texting is a great way to open a conversation. And I, and I tell this to all my students. I tell this to my team, friends, all of the above, right? Texting is great. It's one of my favorite ways to open conversations. But once somebody raises their hand and it says, hey, I'm interested, you need to get them on the phone. Are you doing that? Yeah, so right now, um, whenever they show some slight bit of interest, like what's your offer? Or yes, when they respond yes, I say, okay, I'd like to get a, know a little more about the, uh, the property. Can, is there a time we can get on the call? So I try to quickly get them on the phone. And then when I get them on the phone, I ask them if they were looking to get top dollar for the property or whatever the case may be to see if I could qualify them as a lead or not. Okay. Awesome. I love it. So when you're having these conversations with these people, what kind of questions are you typically asking? I'm just curious. I don't have it. I kind of forgot, but I, I, I normally ask um, if they're trying to get top dollar and, and um, for the property, something Got like it. that. So here's some, some, some pieces of advice that I would suggest changing or adding in, right? I never <laughs> typically ask people if they're looking to get top dollar. The reason is, is the answer is going to always be yes. I mean, who, who's, who's going to want to not get top dollar, right? So yeah. I would stop doing that. This is just my opinion, of course, but I do have a couple hundred deals under my belt. So I would say, hey, you know, here's a great way to, to open up a conversation. You know, hey, you know, hey, Jane. You know, I appreciate you, you know, making some time to talk with me today. You know, I'm an investor and I love buying properties. Um, I don't typically pay retail. All right. So it's kind of the opposite of what you're doing now in terms of, are you looking for top dollar? Right. Because again, their response is going to typically be, yes, of course I'm looking for top dollar. Right. So don't ask that question. That'd be the first thing I would say to change is don't ask that question because it leads to an uphill battle. Right. You're, you know, if you say, Hey, are you looking to get top dollar? They're going to say, yes, it's kind of hard to you know, follow that. So instead I would remove that from what you're saying. And I would replace it with this. Hey, I'm Johan or I'm Dave and I am an investor and I don't typically pay retail. However, I would love to buy your property and the properties that I've, that I typically find, you know, that make the most sense are the ones that need some work. Does your property need any work, right? So notice that I've basically, instead of, instead of trying to disqualify them as being a motivated seller, instead what I've done is I've disqualified myself as being a retail buyer. Do you see the difference there? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, is I would ask them, so here's, here's my pitch. This is what I do. Hey, I'm Dave. You know, Jane, I appreciate you giving me some time to talk today. Um, I am very interested in, in talking to you about this property and hopefully making an offer and maybe even coming out and meeting you to, to view the property. Uh, but before I do so, I just want to ask you a couple questions. You know, I buy a lot of houses, but I don't pay retail for houses. As an investor, you know, I am looking to buy properties that, that, have, that need work so I can buy them and I can fix them up and I can make a profit on them. All right. I do not hide behind the fact that my business is buying properties at a discount and making a profit. All right. So I actually tell people that I don't necessarily say I'm looking to get a big discount on your deal. Right. Mm -hmm. But what I do say is, Hey, as an investor, I need to get a good deal. And typically the ones that, you know, the people that, that are willing to give me a, a good deal are the, are the ones that have properties that need a ton of work. Right. So what I'll typically ask is, you know, does the property need work? All right. And then what I'll typically ask 
And I may even ask this first, but I'll ask them, why do you want to sell or why do you need to sell? And if there's awkward silence after you ask that question, that's okay. It's okay to have a little bit of awkward silence on a phone call, right? But really the point is, is that you want to disqualify yourself as being a retail buyer, number one. And number two, you want to get to the root cause of why they're interested in selling. So if they answer your question, you know, why are you interested in selling? Why do you need to sell? Why do you want to sell? It doesn't matter really how you ask it. You just want to ask them why. That's the main thing. And if they respond back with, oh, you reached out to me and I just wanted to see what your offer is. Hey, no problem. Happily make you an offer. But there's not a lot of motivation there. So what we're looking for is we're looking for people that need to sell. Somebody that wants to sell, that's great and all. Maybe we can do a deal with them. But they have to be motivated. The people that need to sell are going to always be the people that are going to give you the best deal. So I am always going to ask, hey, why do you want to sell this property? And sometimes they're going to say, it's not your business or it's none of your business. Other times they're just going to say, I'm, I can't afford it. I'm getting pre-foreclosed. I owe back taxes. I, have, I had a death in the family. I inherited the property. Um, I have disease or I'm unwell or I'm, un or I'm sick. I'm getting divorced and I need to get rid of the property. My kids, I'm having more kids and I, I, I've outgrown the property or my kids left and they, and they left the house to go to college or just to move out. So I need to downsize, right? Or it could be that I just don't like the neighborhood or I'm moving for my job. There's 11 examples right there, right? Um, and there's really an infinite amount of reasons that somebody would be motivated. What I tend to see is death, divorce, and disease typically make up a lot of it, right? Now, these are things that aren't good. You know, these, are, these aren't things that, I, that I'm wishing on people or hoping that people are dealing with. But here's the thing. At any given time, 5% of the population is in distress. That's a pretty large number. And they're dealing with some sort of problem. And it may not even be the property that's the problem, Johan. But it may be the property that's the problem, Right. So the, a good motivated seller, a really, truly motivated seller is going to be somebody that has an external problem in their life, death, divorce, disease, job relocation. I've even dealt with people that their motivation was I'm going to prison. Like, that's crazy. Like, oh, man, I don't even want to ask why. Like, that's not my business. Right. But you really need to move quick, especially if you're going away to prison in two weeks. You don't want to be going away to prison and like have to deal with this house in there like. Let's get it sold so you can go do that and you don't have to have these worries, right? So the motivation can obviously be a lot of different things. The point is, is I'm going to ask them why they want or need to sell. If they don't answer the why, follow it up with when. And the reason is, is the when will often disclose the why. So I've had people say, in, 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 in rebuttal to my question, why do you want to sell this property? Or why do you need to sell this property? And they say, you know, that's not really something I'm looking to discuss right now. That's not your business. And I'll say, oh, hey, no problem. Just asking, just trying to help. Uh, well, let me ask you some other questions if that's okay. When, when would you like to close? And then it's funny, but people don't even realize it, but they'll often say, well, I would really like to get this thing sold by the end of the month because if I don't, I'm going to lose it. It's like, you just told me the why, even though I asked <laughs> you the when. So the when often will disclose or uncover the why. Not always, but it can. So mm -hmm. the number one thing that you're always going to want to ask people on the phone is why they want to sell. And then if they don't tell you that, ask the when. But even if they do tell you, follow it up with, well, when would you like to close, right? Now, one of my favorite things to do as well is, is whenever we get past the, the, the why in the when, and I ask them, I'll say, okay, you know, let me get a little bit of information about the property. Do you have just a couple minutes? I'm just going to ask you some basic questions. And some of my favorite questions are, you know, how long have you owned the property? Do you, do you um, have you done any updates to it recently? Right. And really what I'm looking for 
is I'm looking for somebody that's done updates in the last five to 10 years. If they say, oh yeah, I rehabbed the kitchen. And I'd be like, oh great, when? And they say 2004. I'm like, well, that was 18 years ago. That kitchen's probably pretty dated, right? So I always want to say, have you done any updates to the property? And people will usually be very, very transparent, very frank, and they'll say, yes, I've done this, this, and this. Or they'll say, no, I haven't. And then I'll, I'll also ask them, hey, wh how long have you owned it? Or when did you buy it? Because if they haven't done any updates, but they've owned it for 15 years, well, that goes to show me right there that, you know, the systems in the house, the HVAC, the water heater, assuming they were brand new when they bought them, they're dated. And if they weren't brand new when they bought the property, they're really dated. The, you know, a roof, you can get 20 to 30 years out of it, but that's like best, 30 years is best case. I own over 60 properties right now. And I can tell you right now, most roofs don't last 30 years. You're going you're gonna to be lucky to get 20 years out of a roof, 25 tops. So if somebody hasn't replaced the roof in 15 years, well, it's going to probably need a roof. Maybe not today, but it's going to need a roof very soon, right? Also, I'm going to ask them, have you done any updates to the kitchens or the baths? And they may say, oh, yeah, I put new hardware on the cabinets. Well, that's... That's nice. That doesn't really help add value to the property. Have you, have you actually redone the kitchen? Have you put in new cabinets or new countertops or light fixtures or water fixtures or whatever it may be in the last five to 10 years? If you haven't, then we would assume that it either needs it or it's going to need it soon. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Same with the flooring. Flooring is something that is often overlooked. Flooring is like the most used thing in your house. You're walking all over it all day long. And if you have any pets, they're walking all over it all day long too. So that's another thing I ask, you know, what's the flooring look like? Does it need to be updated? Have you updated? And if you have updated it, how long ago was it? So once I get through some of these basic questions, right? I start by opening up the conversation by thanking them for their time and by disqualifying myself as a motivated retail buyer. Mm -hmm. Right. So I just basically un I disqualify myself. Hey, I'm an investor. You know, I don't typically, you know, pay full retail for houses. I am looking, you know, to get a deal. However, you know, the best deals typically are the ones that need a lot of work. You know, does your property need work? And I'll dive into that. I'll also ask them why typically I'll start with the why, why do you want to sell? And when would you like to have this sold? Then that's typically when I jump into the quality of the property. And then I kind of wrap it up with, with one or two additional things. I usually will ask them, hey, you know, assuming that I could close fast and, you know, buy this property as is and, um, and do it quickly for you, what's the best price that, that you would be willing to sell it for? What's, you know, what's, what's the best price? And then they're going to answer that. And it doesn't really matter how they answer that question. You're going to be taking notes. But you always want to follow that question up with the next question. The next question is, well, if I was able to close fast and pay cash, can you do any better? That's it. So simple. But you always want to ask that question. And I'll tell you right now, I would go as far as say as 40 to 50% of the time. So roughly half of the time when I ask that follow up question. You start with how much are you looking to get or what's the best price you'd be willing to give me? They tell you, you always want to follow it up with, well, hey, that's great and all, but if I was able to buy it as is, if I was able to close fast and I was able to make this really easy for you, would you be able to do any better? So basically what I'm asking them to do is I'm asking them to compete against themselves. So they, they throw out a number. I need 100. I'm looking to get 160 for it. Oh, that's great, Jane. But if I was able to give you that 160 and I was able to close fast and pay cash and make it really, really easy for you, could you do any better? And I'm telling you, 50% of the time, Jane's going to say, yeah, I could probably do 150 or 155. And it may not be a big discount, but here's the thing. If you don't ask, you're not going to get that discount. And sometimes that discount might be big. It might be 15 or 20 grand, right? So you are always going to want to follow up the how much do you need to get for the property or how much are you looking to get with can you do any better if I provide convenience? 
So those are a couple little pointers and tips and tricks that I would add into your call script right away. Do you have any questions about any of that stuff that I just said? No, that's actually really good. I'm going to rewatch this right after. And like take you got it, man. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's great. Okay. So additionally, some other great tips and tricks for you here. Texting is a great method. It's one of my favorites. Actually, probably my number one favorite, to be honest. But you can't text a landline. Mm -hmm. So when you're going in and you're pulling your leads out of batch leads or prop stream or wherever you're pulling your leads from and you're skip tracing these leads and then you're texting them in batch, I'd assume. What are you doing with all these numbers that you're paying for that aren't mobiles? Probably not. Well, yeah. That's okay. So here's the thing. All these people that have landlines, you can't text. There's, there's no way to do that. But what you can do is you can cold call these individuals. So what I would definitely recommend is after you pull a list and you text all the mobiles, export the landlines and start calling those landlines because you're, you're, you're basically not getting through to any of these property owners that you, I'm assuming you're pulling vacant lists, you're pulling um, off markets, you're pulling um, absentee owns, and there's a lots of other little niche lists. My favorites, obviously, are the absentees and the vacants. I think everybody should start there because that's your low hanging fruit. Uh, but again, if you text the list, you're only reaching, you know, it could be 20%, it could be 90%. It, it's going to vary on the market and on a lot of factors. But landlines, a lot of old people, they still have landlines. They still use landlines. To us young guys, and you're half my age, but like landline, you're like, really? That's crazy. But like, I'm telling you, man, there's a lot of people, especially to probably down in Florida, got a lot of elderly people down there that moved down there to retire and they want that yeah. warm weather. There's the a lot of- I had a landline. So you, you have one? No, like the person I did with the deal with, like cold calling, they had a landline. So- Boom. Yeah. There you go. So what I'm, what I, all I'm saying is, is I think you're leaving a lot of opportunity on the table. Now this is going to create more work because you're mm -hmm. going to have to export these people and you're going to have to dial these people. Right. And that may be where a virtual assistant can come in and help you. Maybe you want to do it. Um, I like batch dialer because you can, you can automate and speed things up. I can do three or four lines at a time and I can reach a lot of these people very, very quickly. Right. But at the end of the day, I think you're leaving a lot of opportunity on the table, only texting. And I'm not suggesting you stop texting. What I am doing is I'm suggesting that you add the cold calling on top of the texting because you can't text landlines. And when you skip trace, you're skip tracing both. You're skip tracing the mobiles and the landlines. <laughs> I love it. All right, cool. Well, let's, let's stop there. I don't want to throw too much at you, but I think, I think you're already doing great because you're marketing and you're getting in touch with people and you're sending 500, 600, 700 texts a day. That's great. Don't stop doing that. Keep doing that. Keep following up with the leads that have some sort of motivation. Don't forget that the goal is to get people on the phone. So yes, texting is a great way to open up a conversation, but it's, but I mean, I'm telling you, man, I've only done a couple deals where people just wanted to text the whole time. And I'm telling you, there are going to be people like that. And that's fine. If somebody's preferred method of communication is to text, then text. But what you should make a, a goal and a focus is to get people on the phone. All right. So I would say, you know, keep doing that. Whenever you do get them on the phone, change your script a little bit. And I can even send you a, a couple scripts real quick to help you with this. But don't ask people if they're looking to get top dollar. You're shooting yourself in the foot. Instead, introduce yourself. Tell them you're an investor. Tell them that you don't typically pay retail. You don't even need to mention that you're looking for a discount or a deal. Just say that you don't pay retail. You're an investor. You're looking to make a profit on a deal. And you're typically looking for, deal, for properties that have problems. Or, and don't say this out loud, but you're looking for people that have problems too. Because that, that's what makes people motivated, Right? Um, ask them why they want to sell and then ask them when they want to sell next, get as much information about the property as you can. What kind of property it is it? How many, have you done any updates recently? 
And if so, what were they and how long ago were they? That's going to give you a generalized idea of the condition of the property. One of my favorite things to do is ask somebody, hey, what type of property is it? And you're probably thinking, well, that could go a couple of ways. And here's the thing. A type of property could mean single family. It could mean ranch. It could mean duplex. It could mean two story. It could even mean the type of home. Like, is it, you know, a colonial home or, I mean, there's, it's such a broad question. And the funny thing is, is whenever I often ask people, Hey, what kind, what type of property is it? They don't really know how to answer it. And they'll just say, it's a piece of crap. It's not what I asked. I asked what type it is, but they may not know how to, how to answer that question. So they're just going to tell you what they think about it. Well, if somebody tells you, Hey, this is a piece of crap property, then they're probably pretty motivated or the property probably needs a lot of work, which will most likely make for a good deal. Right. So ask them why they want to sell, get to the motivation, ask them when they want to sell. That'll also help you get to the motivation and determine if it's high or not. Right. Then after you ask them those questions, ask them what they are looking to get for it or what they need to get in order to sell it. And then immediately follow up that. What do you want for it with? Well, if I can offer a great amount of convenience by paying cash and closing quick and buying it as is. So you don't have to go and make a bunch of repairs. Can you do better? Or are you willing to, you know, to do any better? And you can word that a couple different ways, of course. But again, most of the time, half the time, people are going to come down on their number and you're essentially getting them to negotiate against themselves. All right. Now, from there, once you determine the level of motivation, why they want to sell, when they want to sell, what they're asking for the property, if they can do any better, and what the condition of the property is, at that point, you can determine, hey, is this worth setting up a time to go meet this individual? And in the beginning, I would say go meet anybody and everybody you can because getting in the door is going to make it a lot easier to get them to build trust with you. Know that you want them to like you, know you, and trust you, right? If it's not worth the appointment, then you can make them an offer. Now, when you're making offers to people, now here's another thing. Sometimes you may say, what are you looking to get? And they say, I don't really have a number in mind. Make me an offer. And that happens all the time. When that happens, here's what I'll typically do. I will go and I will pull up Batch or PropStream or even Zillow. If you don't have any of these paid softwares, guys, go and use Zillow and find the Zestimate. All right. And take either somewhere between 50 and 70% of that number. And that is what your offer is going to be. And the reason is, is you may be willing to pay more than 50% of this estimate, but you want to anchor low. So somebody says, hey, I'm looking for 150,000. You know, and I'll say, okay, well, does the property need any work? And they're going to say, yeah, it needs a little bit of work. It needs this, it needs that, but it's not crazy. It's, you can live in it the way that it is, even though it's dated. I'll say, okay, great. Well, here's the thing. I'm typically buying properties in the neighborhood. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, you know, let's say 60% of 150,000. So I'm going to pull up my calculator here in the background. I'm going to type in 150. I'm going to multiply that by, let's say, 0.6, which is halfway between 50 and 70%. That puts me at 90,000. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, I'm typically buying properties in this neighborhood or in this part of town, you know, that are similar to yours that also need some work for around 90,000. Now, am I willing to pay more than that? Of course, but I don't want to go in too high. Because I can always come up, but getting the seller to come down isn't going to be as easy, right? So I'm going to anchor. It's called anchoring. I'm going to say, hey, I'm already buying properties in the neighborhood, or I'd be interested in properties in your area in this scenario, this example, for around 90000 And I'm just going to stop. I'm going to wait. And there may be a 30 seconds of awkward silence. But I'm going to wait after I make my offer. And then, I'm, and then if it goes beyond, let's say, a minute, then I'm going to say, hey, are you still there? You know, what do you think of my offer? Am I crazy? You know, and what's going to either happen is they're going to say, yeah, there's no way. This estimate's 150. I need to get 150. They're not motivated. Move on. Or they may say, hey, 90 is actually not crazy. Let's do it. Send me over a contract or when do you want to come see the property? Or the other option is, is they say, you know, I was really looking to get closer to like 100 or 110. Well, hey, you're still at a discount from 150 ARV. Now to determine if that's going to be a deal or not is all going to depend on the level of repairs. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Perfect. These are just some pro tips here. 
So anchor low. So why do I say between 50 and 70%, Johan? Here's why. The reason is, is I've purchased over 700 houses. And at the end of the day, we're going to use a simple formula called the MAO formula. And you're basically solving for your max allowable offer. You start by running comps and you get your ARV. You multiply that by 0.7 or 0.75 or 0.8, depending on you know, how aggressive you want to be. If you're wholesaling, you want to be closer to 0.7. If you're a landlord, you can go higher, closer to 0.8. But as an investor like yourself, you probably want to be somewhere around 0.7 or 0.75. So your comps, your ARV times, let's call it 0.75 for this example, minus your repairs. Well, what that ends up getting to is usually somewhere around 50 to 65, maybe even 70 cents on the dollar. If it needs no repairs or very little, you're going to end up being somewhere between, I'm going to, I'm going to say just for simple math, somewhere between 50 and 70 cents on the dollar after you get through your MAO formula. So from the hip, you don't have to go calculate this entire formula out and go run comps. You can just jump right ahead and just say, Hey, I'm going to offer 60 or 65% of what the Zestimate is. And again, the Zestimate's not always a great estimate of ARV, but from the hip, it's easy enough and it's good enough to make an initial offer. And again, if they say, no, that's crazy. Well, maybe follow up, maybe don't, maybe move on. If they, if they take your offer, that's great. Boom. You're ready to roll. Now go do now send your offer, go run the appointment, start doing your due diligence. And if that number ends up being too high, you can negotiate them down later. If they counter you and they say, Hey, 90 doesn't work, but I, I owe, 98. So I would sell it for a hundred. Well, Hey, that's still a $50,000 discount depending on, you know, based upon the ARV or the, or the after repair value. If your repairs are only five or 10 or 15 grand, that might make for a deal. If the repairs are 60 grand, then it's not going to make for a deal. So you always are going to want to factor in those repairs, but you don't need to overcomplicate it and overthink the process of making an offer out the gate. Just make one anchor low and then see how they respond. And here's the cool thing. Sometimes when you, when you anchor low, they're going to accept it. You might've been willing to pay 10, 15,000 more for the property. But if you anchor low and they're really motivated, they may say, yeah, that's, I'd like to get more, but listen, I'm, I need to get this thing sold. So go ahead and send me that offer. Let me review it. Let me sleep on it. We'll, we'll probably be able to get this done. But again, I think the most important thing this is constantly making offers to people. The more, the more marketing you do, the more opportunity you're going to have to talk to people. You know that you're doing it already, mm -hmm. right? But if you're not making offers to every single person that you're talking to, you're leaving opportunity on the table. Just like I think you're leaving some opportunity on the table by disregarding all those landlines. So maybe what you do is, is you text three or four days a week. And then the other one or two days a week, you spend that same amount of time that you were texting and you just start calling people on those landlines. You can even call the mobiles too. Another thing that we like to do in our business is we'll send out 500, 700,000 texts like you just said. And then two or three days later, we'll go in and we'll look at all the people that didn't respond. We'll send them another text. We'll follow up saying, hey, John, hey, Johan, hey, Jane. I sent you a text two, three days ago and I didn't hear back from you. You know, are you the owner of this one? Do you have interest in selling it? You're going to get a lot of people that are going to respond to that second text. Well, guess what? If they don't respond to one, two, maybe even three texts, now is a good opportunity to actually pick up the phone and call the people, even if it's a mobile. So don't discount picking up the phone and actually reaching out and calling these people. Texting is great. It's easy. It's quick. It's convenient. It's cost effective. All of the above. Mm -hmm. But not everybody's going to respond to a random number. A lot of people may not have interest or you know, texting might not be their preferred method of communication, right? So just similar to the landlines where you can't text, don't you know, neglect or, or, or disregard the people that aren't responding to your texts. Maybe now's a good time to go back and see who you've sent text to that hadn't respond, send them another text, follow up with them. And if you've mm -hmm. done that, and, and I'm not saying after, if they don't respond once, call them, you can, if you want. But what we like to do is if we send them two or three or four texts and they still aren't responding, then that's a great opportunity for us to go in and actually pick up the phone and call them. And then if we get them on the phone, we're going to be polite. We're going to tell them the truth. Hey, John, 
I've been trying to reach you. I sent you two or three texts. You're probably busy. No big deal. I get it. But I'm trying to reach you about one, two, three Main Street. Are you the owner? Yes. No. Great. Awesome. I'm an investor. I'm looking to buy a couple more properties this month. Do you have interest in selling? That's it. That's the pitch. It's so easy. But you got to pick up that phone and make that call. What do you think? Some good tips right there? Yeah, yeah. I actually never thought about giving them another text back. Oh, man. And you probably have thousands in your system. If you've... If you're sending yeah. 500, 600, 700 texts a day and you're only dealing with the people that are responding to your texts, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. So go in and there's a filter in batch. I'm actually, I got batch pulled up on my screen right here. If I go into my inbox and I go into, I think it's called no response. There's an actual filter yeah, in no. there. No response. Go in there and hit all those people again. And just say, hey, I'm just following up. Did you get my last text? And they maybe they didn't. Maybe they were busy or maybe they did and they weren't interested. So mm -hmm. go in there and, and follow up with those people. Follow up is the name of the game. Marketing gets the leads in the door. Follow up is what gets them closed. All right. If you're only banking on get, doing deals from your initial outbound, yeah, you can do deals that way, Johan. But it's going to be very few. Very few. The majority of the deals that, that, that we get done, we followed up with these people 7, 10, 12, 15 times at a minimum typically, right? Mm -hmm. So persistence is very, very, very important. So here's what I'm going to do, man. I'm going to actually, uh, this video is being recorded. I'm going to drop this on my YouTube so you can watch it over again. This is going to be really, really great pointers for you. Let's circle back in a week or two. And we can do this again. I told you I'd help you out here. Okay. Um, I want to see you do more deals. You've done one deal already? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. one deal. And it was a joint venture? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. joint venture. And you had mentioned the other day, you had hit me up and asking about, you know, joint venture with other wholesalers. I love it. I think that's a great idea too. But don't put all your eggs in that basket because you're going to be splitting your deals with these people. And they may find a buyer before you do and cut you out. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't yeah. ever want to have all your eggs in just the joint venture basket. Joint venture is a great opportunity for anybody and everybody. Love doing JVs. But at the end of the day, I'm not banking on joint ventures. Those are just yeah. icing on the cake. What I'm banking on, excuse me, is my marketing to these sellers and my consistency, my persistence, and my ability to keep following up with people until literally three things happen. Do you know what those three things are? Probably not. I'll tell you. It's all good. One, they sold the property to somebody else. Okay, I'm going to mark that as a dead lead. They sell it to me. I'm going to mark that as a done deal, home run deal. Love it. Three, they tell me to quit calling them or texting them. No problem. I'll stop. But I'm not going to stop unless one of those three things happens, bro. They sell it to somebody else. They sell it to me or they tell me to stop contacting them. If they don't, if, if one of those three things doesn't happen, I'm going to keep hitting them with text. I'm going to keep calling them. I'm going to, if I have an email, I may try to reach out to them for your email. And if they're on three or four or five or six of my lists and I can't reach them by phone or email or text message, then I might even go drive to their house and knock on the door and just be like, Hey, I'm trying to reach you about this property. You and I've been, I've been trying to call you and I can't get through to you. Do you have interest in selling? Go the extra mile is my point. All right. So okay. awesome, man. You're doing great. The fact that you're marketing and you're out here hustling and you're 17 years old is amazing. It inspires me and it's going to inspire everybody that watches this video as well. I promise you. Appreciate that. You're the man. Bro. I also have a, I'm going to talk to a seller right after we, uh, we speak mm -hmm. and like do the stuff we, you told me to do because mm -hmm. he's pretty motivated. He said about $35,000 in repairs needed. Awesome. That he wants to get rid of the home. So how I'm much is the ARV on it? I think 240 and then i'm gonna offer him 140k hell yeah so let's just do some math 240 is the arv let's times that by 0.75 this is an aggressive market and then you said the repairs are 35 so we'll minus out 35 that's 145 and you're gonna offer him 140 yeah i, I did a an 80 percent just because the buyers here are paying like up to 90 that's fine even better yeah so you built yourself yeah. in a 10 to fifteen thousand dollar wholesale on that deal then yeah just in case bro i love it Call oh, that guy right away. Yeah. Build rapport. You know, here's the thing. If 
you can tell I talk a lot. This, this is supposed yeah. to be a 10 to 15 minute call. We're approaching 40 minutes. I don't care. It's all good. I like you. Right. Yeah. People like to talk. Let them talk. If they want to talk to you about their dog or their kid or their pet or their business, listen. Right. Build rapport with these people. Ask them why they want to sell. So important. Mm -hmm. Ask them when they want to sell. Ask them what the best price they would sell it to you for is. And then you're going to follow up with what question after they tell you what, what they want. Considering I have paying with cash and as is, what's, is, what's the best you can do for me? Or can you, you do better? This. You got yeah. this, man. Yeah, you got yeah. this. Awesome, man. Well, that, that's good. Change the pitch a little bit. Don't say, are you looking for full retail? Let's just shoot yourself in the foot. Yeah, Stop yeah. doing that. Instead, focus more on the fact that you're eager to buy. You're interested in buying. Um, you want to learn more about the property. You want to learn more about them, right? Why yeah. do they want to sell? When do they want to sell it? What are they trying to get for? Have they made any updates? You know, try to learn a little bit more about the property. Don't forget, make an offer every single time. And if you don't make an offer because you're not sure, then just say, hey, let me run some numbers and call you right back. And, call, and then do that. Don't just say that and then go to, to the park or whatever, you know, <laughs> your buddies. I'm telling you, go look at the numbers, do some math. Call them back, text them back, say, hey, here's where I'm thinking would, you know, would, would, would make for a good deal for both of us here. How do you feel about this offer? So on and so forth. Just don't forget, follow up like crazy. Follow up on the text messages that didn't respond. Follow up with the ones that did, that maybe aren't super motivated. Those you can maybe push off a couple weeks. But mm -hmm. the ones that you send and they don't respond, the no response filter in batch, there's no reason that you wouldn't want that you can't follow up with those people the next day or two days later. Yeah. You don't need to wait a week. I wouldn't suggest texting them more than once in a day because then it's just a little aggressive. Yeah. But you can obviously text them on the, the next day or two days later. You don't need to wait a week or a month to follow up, right? And then last yeah. but not least, anybody that you've texted two, three, four times that you can't get a response, call. Say, hey, I'm just trying to reach you. I'm not trying to bother you just trying to reach you see if you own this property if you have interest in selling and then last but not least is all these landlines and the beautiful thing is, is if you go into batch which i'm pretty sure you're using you told me you're using that and you go into the skip trace area or no go into the campaigns area whenever you add a campaign and you can actually export out if you go into any of your campaigns go into campaigns click view or edit you can actually scroll down and you can actually see what lists were imported and you can actually export out the landlines. You can't text those landlines, but you're paying for them. So yeah. use them, call them, right? And again, if, if, if you don't have the time, then that might be a good opportunity to bring in a virtual assistant to help reach more people. This is a marketing business at the end of the day, period. Real estate, it just so happens that it's the product that we're buying and selling. But the business, Johan, is marketing. That's the business. We're marketing to find a deal. We're marketing to find a buyer to sell the deal to. It's marketing on the front end and on the back end, my friend. So all in all, bro, I got to hand it to you. You're doing great. You're, you have very, very good consistency. And you got good energy too. You've already done a deal. Amazing. Let's get you five or 10 more. That's the plan. Sound like a plan? Yeah, sounds like awesome, a plan. Bro. Well, I'm here to help you. As always, you know. Anybody that's watching this on YouTube, Johan's one of my students, guys. He's 17. I'm super impressed with this guy. I wish I started when I was 17. He's already got a deal under his belt, and we're going to help him do more deals. And I wanted to, 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 to record this call and throw it up on YouTube, not only so he can rewatch this call, but anybody and everybody else that's interested in learning more about real estate. This is the kind of things that we do when we're on our coaching calls. You know, we want to guide. We want to help. We want to assist, right? If you guys have, have um, or you want to get more information about working with me, I'm going to drop a link below this video where you can book a call as well. Johan, you got this, my friend. Thank get you. out there, get that marketing going, follow up, change your pitch a little bit. And you're doing everything right. You just need to tweak it a little <laughs> bit. Some small tweaks make, make for big moves, right? Mm -hmm. So take some of the things that I had mentioned in this call and implement and let me know, you know, how things go. Let me know as well how that call goes later today with, with that seller. Because that, that, might, that might be one, my friend. You might have your Yeah, everyone. this seems pretty motivated, so let's see. I love it. I love it. All right, man. Well, I'm here to help. Reach out when you need me. Guys, if you want to do one of these calls, 
and you're looking for a coach, I am here to help. I'll put a, a link below the video to book a call. And with that, Johan, signing off, my friend. I'm here to help you. Hit me up when you need me, all right? Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, brother. We'll see you soon.